Okay, so that will start the recording. And uh, um, okay, so then we'll uh, go ahead and introduce uh, Adam. So uh, Adam is indeed our uh, first speaker for this uh, series. So um, uh, Adam is, uh, is a lecturer, which is the UK equivalent of an assistant professor uh, at the um, uh, Department of Mathematics and Statistics at Lancaster University. Uh, and he's specifically a lecturer in data science. Uh, so very appropriate for this, this series. Um, his research is focused on time series analysis and spatial statistics. And he's especially uh, you know, focused on spectral techniques using uh, Fourier transforms. Um, one of his application areas is, is oceanography. Um, and, and in particular, he's been working on this very exciting global data set of surface drifters, uh, which I believe will be the focus of the, of the talk today, uh, which, is, which is really exciting. It's you know, one of these examples of a modern large scale big data problem, which you know, really benefits from interaction from, from statisticians. Um, and, uh, um, and also, uh, you know, Adam is one of these people who really takes both the statistics and the domain science application very seriously, which is exactly what this series, this webinar series is all about. So he's uh, uh, a great uh, speaker to start this, this series. Um, uh, with that, um, uh, I will turn it over to, to Adam. So uh, Adam, please uh, uh, go ahead. Thanks, Mikhail. Uh, thanks for that, that introduction. And thank you to, to you and to Anne and to Larry for putting together this great series. I think opening it up, like Anne mentioned, um, to a wider community makes sense because the interest here lies, you know, in Carnegie Mellon, but also, also beyond. And, uh, and thank you for, for, for inviting me um, to give a talk. And uh, I sort of go through the list. I apologize, I see some familiar names, which is great. And I apologize, some people have seen a overlapping iteration of this talk before, but hopefully there will be some, some new things or you don't just mind hearing some of that again. And those who were at Ocean Sciences would have got the condensed version because we get a hurried 12 minutes there. Um, uh, but for those of you who, who haven't seen it before, um, I hope I hope you'll find it enjoyable. I've I thought about this and decided, given our potentially diverse audience, I won't be overly technical with with equations and, and sort of try to keep it keep it visual with, with with some equations. Hopefully, that's sort of appropriate for a Friday as well as our brains wind down for the weekend. Um, so yeah, I will share screen. Uh, and hopefully uh, the presentation will, will come up and, and I'll try to put it into full screen mode as well. So that, yeah, yeah, I'll just, Mikhail, can you give me a nod that that's, uh, that's all right? Yeah, yeah that's great. fine. Great, terrific. Um, so Mikhail, maybe like I can't see monitor the chat, so you can just interrupt me if, if there are questions. Maybe would that work? Yeah. yeah, let's do that. So so both me and Nick will be monitoring the chat and the, the raised hands. So so you don't need to worry about those. Just uh, uh, focus on the talk. We'll let you know if there are any questions. Great. Yeah. Terrific. So um, so yeah, my talk is going to be about stochastic modeling of the ocean uh, using drifters. For those of you who don't know what drifters are, I will shortly say. Um, and focusing on this idea of the Lagrangian perspective, which helps us to connect with, with the physics. Um, I provide my, my uh, email here. Uh, so please do get in touch if you've got any, uh, uh, any questions or want to potentially collaborate afterwards. And this is joint work with a number of really great people on both sides of the pond. Um, so I spent three years in, in Seattle. Um, working with Jeffrey Early and Jonathan Lilly, who are oceanographers. And um, on this side of the pond, I've been um, mentored by Sophia, who's a professor in EPFL, um, and worked with Arthur and Michael, who are sort of very talented uh, postdocs slash PhDs. Um, and also this is in close collaboration with people based at uh, Miami, University of Miami slash NOAA, but based in Miami, so Rick uh, Lampkin Shen, Ali Pohn and Ellis Paris, who've contributed to some of the things that I'm going to uh, talk about today and provided useful advice um, over the past year. So they're all oceanographers, but with a statistical 
interest. So this is kind of like a nice intersection of stats and oceanography, this crowd, which I've really enjoyed working with. Um, yeah, so, uh, so what's a drifter? For those of you who have not come across one of these before, well, basically, it's, you could think of it as a very high-tech version of a message in a bottle. So how have we monitored our oceans more recently with satellites, but our knowledge of the currents can go back uh, to, to BC times, and that's not before COVID, that's uh, before Christ, you know, going sort of like 4,000 years. Um, and that is, um, I've just seen, you know, how BC being uh, referred to differently now. Um, and they, they, um, their knowledge comes from the fact that they, they, they threw these messages in a bottle, they tagged them in the Mediterranean and saw where they washed up. And that's some of how our earliest current maps came about. Um, but, you know, there you might know where you started and ended a, a, a deployment of such an instrument. But what we, the, the high tech version is to um, sort of, you know, package it in, 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 more, in a more modern way. And um, one key part is here we see in the second picture that it's thrown into the ocean. And what you see, this extra stuff, the, 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 the ball that you see um, here, I'll go to my mouse, is the, uh, is the drifter itself, but it has this stuff attached, which is a, a tether and a, a drogue. And the idea here is to give it sort of the right amount of, of drag so that a drifter um, mimics the motion of a particle of water at or near the surface, rather than sort of being blown around by the wind otherwise. Um, but the part at the top will have some kind, like a GPS drifter or some kind of uh, uh, location sensor, and it can communicate information to passing satellites. And that can actually include things like temperature and salinity, as well as just its, its position. Um, and, uh, and, some, and, and they've got battery and some of them can last for a long time. So here we see Drifter 26,000 and number 26,028, which actually is a battery lasted a good 10 years and captured a lot of data from, from the North Pacific. So here you see a really elaborate journey that it went on um, meandering, meandering across the ocean. Um, so this is a program now that goes back uh, over 40 years. The first deployments were in 1979. And, uh, and this animation uh, shows you the evolution of, of this data set and of this program. And I'll start running it now. And what you'll see is that the drifters will slowly populate our oceans. The date is shown there in uh, Central Asia for representation. And this video is going to loop. And you'll see how we've sort of developed this, this global coverage um, from this program. And the colors here represent the current speed. Um, so you can see so the red is that you can start probably seeing like the, what we call the boundary currents, things like the Gulf Stream off the east coast of the US, not far from, from where you are. Um, and uh, in Japan, you've got the sort of equivalent Kurashio current uh, sort of uh, over here. And those are sort of the reds, and you've got sort of the, the bluer regions, which you might think of like the, the garbage patches, the sort of areas in the ocean where the things get stuck um, happening in sort of, uh, sort of some of the mid, sort of mid-north Atlantic, mid-south Atlantic, you might sort of see these, these kind of gyres forming here, here and here and so on. Um, so it's a really, really interesting data set with a lot of heterogeneity, right? Um, Here's the, uh, the status uh, as of just uh, what, four days ago. And this time the colors represent the deploying country. Um, so you'll see that the US has contributed, uh, currently there's 1500 drifters out there, part, approximately half of which uh, from the deployed by the US, but, but it's, it's sort of this, this nice global, global effort, participants from, from all sorts of countries. And, if you're interested in this data set, you can download it yourself from the NOAA website. If you want to hear more about how it's collated, um, the challenges of, of, of pre-processing and so on, then um, there's this a plug here for a paper that Shen uh, wrote. This is sort of probably a most recent reference on 
on the, the aspects of, uh, of the data. So it's a good reference if you just want to learn more about its history, how it's collected and pre-processed and, and what kind of information you can get out. And there's a link to download the most recent data set at the highest hourly resolution. So the idea is the information from each drifter, its location is, is, is given every hour using an interpolation algorithm uh, that Shen came up with. Um, and there's, there's a lot of interest in this pre-processing challenge. So, so Jeffrey here is early in this paper, I worked, collaborated with him on, has also um, developed a spline-based procedure for pre-processing that deals nicely with, with outliers. And in the interest of time, actually, I won't go into this figure, which is a quite elaborate and complicated, but just sort of shows how uh, the trajectory um, removes the effect of outliers, which are these dots that you see that aren't, aren't where they should be, which can happen because of bad satellite positioning. We've all seen that on our phones before, I'm sure. Um, but also gets the right kind of trajectory smoothness and that's what splines are really great for and Jeffrey did a good job to sort of connect it with the physics this idea that the tension in the smoothing splines is, is a physical concept right um, so that's just another another plug really before I I go on to the actual modeling um, so people who deal with drifter data often like to just call these sorts of plots spaghetti plots so these are all of the trajectories that the journeys that all of the drifters have been on across the ocean just dumped into one big one big plot here and you can kind of see the the enormous challenge we face and in the global drifter program you might have around 100 million um sort of spatial temporal fixes in aggregation um across this plot so it's it's but we, we have this fairly nice spatial coverage. There are areas of the ocean where drifters don't visit so much and areas that they're, they're, they're more sort of more clustered. That's partly to do with deployment. But if you wanna go into the physics, that's also actually a little bit related to the idea of convergent zones as well, because drifters stay at the surface. So of course you may get this idea that a water particle might have upwelling and downwelling regions, but the drifters are sort of stuck at the surface. So you can actually get these sort of clusterings that form too, but I'm not going to go too much into that um, today. Um, but when faced with this challenge of like, as a statistician, how might we go about modeling this kind of data? Then actually one of the first questions we might need to ask is a question that, that physicists uh, will often ask when thinking about um, differential equation modeling, which is, you know, what is our frame of reference? And there's a bit of hit nice history here because um, this, this can go back to the 18th, 18th century mathematicians where we have Euler and Lagrange, after which we are named two different frames of references. Um, so in an Eulerian sense, you would think about observing a fluid flow through a fixed spatial location over time. So you might think about standing, for example, at a bridge over water and just standing there and looking and collecting information on the water that passes under the bridge as you go. You might just collect all of that data as that happens. An alternative is the Lagrangian perspective where the observer follows a fluid particle as it moves through space and time. So if you're a log on that river, you would sit on that log and record your journey as you, as you, as you go along that, along that river. And if you sample those both fully, you can get the equivalent data set through two different frames of reference. You could just record everything through each spatial location, or you could observe everything that happens with every fluid particle and sort of collect the equivalent information in some closed system uh, through both means. Um, and both perspectives do come into play with, with drifters. Um, we could think of this in that Eulerian sense. So in an Eulerian perspective, we could think about averaging the data. So here is a nice plot of the annual mean drifter speed um, in centimeters per second uh, through different regions of the ocean. So all we've done here is, this isn't my plot, um, this is pulled from a paper, but uh, is they've discretized 
the ocean spatially into, into sort of bins and they've sort of smoothed it afterwards and look what speed has have the drifters gone through through that location and average that out and you can see that they can go um, the red regions are sort of the main currents that we're familiar with the Gulf Stream etc Gulf Stream being here uh, the equatorial currents and so on and then we have those sort of quiet regions that I spoke about about before. Um, so that's one perspective and averaging is great. It tells us a great summary of the data, but averaging as statisticians will know is also a waste if that's all that we do. There's more information content in this data than just to average everything out and get these basic summary statistics. And then this is where I argue the Lagrangian perspective is, is very useful. So let's just consider one trajectory. Now this trajectory might not, is uh, uh, not far from where Mikhail used to be actually. So it's just off the coast of, uh, of, of North Carolina there. Um, so that's where it's sort of located. And we see this, this beautiful trajectory uh, that one of the drifters has, has followed. Um, and it started here in, in the bottom left and ended in the, uh, in the bottom right. And then these red and green regions I've highlighted for um, in the next few slides, I'm going to look at those regions, that part of the data set um, in more detail. Yeah. Um, and what we see is a lot of features here, right? We see that the drifters aren't just moving with currents, but they're also oscillating here a lot. You'll see in this region here, and then even like you've got these sort of wiggly bits here and so on. So we see the drifters sort of spinning, not just not just shooting off in straight lines, right? And with this high resolution data that we, we're getting now, we can pick up more and more of that, okay? Um, and, and here's sort of a picture of, of, of why this, this region is particularly interesting because it's, it's, it's sort of being uh, thrown out of the Gulf Stream, this, this, this drifter, right? Okay. I'm going to pause there and see if anyone's got got any questions because I feel like I'm just talking a lot and talking very quickly. Okay. Cool. Uh, hi, Adam. I, will... I'll, 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 I have a I have a question. Uh, are sure. these drifters using uh, what sort of satellite system are they using? Is it you know Argos, Iridium, or both? Yeah, uh, I, I do know. I may have seen Shen on the call a second ago, and if Shen is on, I might invite him to answer that. Uh, hi, yes, I'm happy to yeah. answer. Thank you. Shen. Actually, no problem. There are like two systems. So historically, the drifters were tracked by the Argos system, as you mentioned, okay. yeah. and their data was also transmitted via the Argos system. And but since the beginning of uh, the 2000s, uh, the array has transitioned to tracking the drifters, positioning the drifters by GPS, and mm -hmm. transmitting their data via Iridium. So, so now we have only a couple of uh, less than 100 drifters that are still tracked by Argos, and all new drifters that are being deployed are tracked by GPS, and the data are transmitted by Iridium. I see. Well, thank thank right. you. Thanks, yeah, uh, Adam, I see another question in the chat box. Um, yeah. So what is the time scale in this picture? Um, ah, yes, that, um, I, I do have that somewhere. I don't uh, have that, but we're certainly talking, um, we're, we're certainly talking like the time scale of the order of a year or something like this for this, this data, like this whole thing that we're looking at. Okay, thanks. We're not talking about something happening within a day or anything like right. that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. So now Actually, I think I just saw one more hand going up. Uh, was there one more question? Yes. Um, yes. Good afternoon. Um, just a brief question. Uh, what happens if you need to study some more localized currents? For example, I noticed that there was scarcely a single drifter found, say, in the Red Sea. 
which is cut off by a narrow strait from the Indian Ocean. The, it, does it happen simply because nobody um, launches drifters uh, in that area? Uh, th this is a really great question, and, and I, I will have a little bit more on that, which I might not have time for today. But what we sometimes get are these regional deployments, and they actually deploy a number of drifters together. And that's actually particularly valuable because if you deploy just one drifter, you can sort of track the currents and some of the, the oscillations. But when you deploy lots of them, you sort of get to see how they move together and how they spread. And you can learn a bit more about the local characteristics of that region. I don't know about the Red Sea, but there have been a number of deployments in the Gulf of Mexico and the Mediterranean Sea. Um, but I don't know about the Red Sea. I know that in in um, in Kaust that they are, that they are in, they have been monitoring data in the Red Sea, but I don't know if they've deployed drifters. Yeah, well, I'm sure that from the Mediterranean drifters are unlikely to pass through the through Suez Canal. They don't go through the they don't go through the canals. No, probably no. no. So you have to launch something of the Red Sea coast. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Cool, nice questions, yeah. Yeah, uh, so... There's one more also on the chat box. Uh, so uh, there's a question, is there evidence that it, it, it truly stays uh, with, uh, within a classical Lagrangian parcel? So I the question, do the, do the uh, floats or so the drifters, do they actually stay within the actual Lagrangian uh, parcels? What do you mean? I don't quite follow that question. Um, so. uh, would that person, Chris Forrest, would, would, would you like to clarify? Sure. Um, I guess the question is whether or not the, the, the drifter is being dragged along and therefore not actually representing a parcel that's moving in a ah. classical sense, or is it a, and therefore, you know, it's, it's an assumption that these are Lagrangian parcels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it is an assumption. And I think to first order, it's, it's correct. I mentioned a bit about things like upwelling and downwelling that they won't capture because they're sort of droved at this fixed depth. Um, but there's also the issue of just instrument malfunction. Sometimes the drogue falls off. So they have these undrogue drifters which behave very differently. So these are sort of when you just have that top bit and they're sort of much more energetic and, and move around more. But the ones that are behaving well have sort of been, you know, designed to try and be um, good, you know, to, to mimic um, a parcel. Um, but I won't comment on, there, there will be literature on how accurate that is, but, but I'm not an expert on that. Thanks. No. And uh, in the chat box, Fred commented that the, 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 the drifters that are designed to follow the current at, at 15 meters. Uh, but I suggest that let's go on with the with the talk to, so that we keep keep time. But uh, everybody can read from the chat box uh, the, the extra comments from there. Yeah, we can do this every sort of. We can do this again in ten minutes and again in twenty, and then wrap up or something like that, Mikhail. Yeah. Um, that sounds good. That sounds like good. That. Cool, cool. Yeah, so I'll I'll just give you a bit more here on sort of the what stuff we've done on stochastic modeling uh, in this Lagrangian frame of reference. So this idea, this is that we can, we can get these velocities from these drifters by looking at their, their sort of change in position over time. Um, so if we look at that red segment of that trajectory I just showed you and look at their eastward and northward velocities, typically called uh, U and, and V in, in, in oceanography, and th just this nice idea that we can just represent that together, and this is quite commonly done in oceanography as a complex value time series. Um, so down here, Z equals U plus, plus IV at, um, at time T, right? And, and what we can do with that, uh, one thing we can do is this idea of a Lagrangian frequency spectrum. So here I've just, just taken the, the Fourier transform, fast Fourier transform of Z, uh, taken it, uh, its absolute value and squared it. And you get this idea of this, for those of you who know spectral analysis of how the variability of the time series is, is decomposed across different frequencies. Um, so most of you who've done a time series 101 will know that, but what you might not be as familiar with is that for complex value time series, 
there's this notion of negative and positive frequencies and the spectrum is asymmetric. And this is the idea that you have a direction of spin. So here for this green trajectory here, we have a number of clockwise oscillations happening, especially there, here just in the middle of the, of the signal. And that's responsible for this uh, negative frequency hump here in the spectrum. And that's actually attributed to the uh, Coriolis force. So that's the Coriolis frequency inducing something called an inertial oscillation in, in, in the drifter. So that's just sort of the spin of the Earth on its own axis, um, creating this oscillation which we can pick up. And it's at, so clockwise rotations are negative frequency by convention um, and vice versa. And we also observe this peak at zero. And this is just the sort of, you know, for those of you who've studied sort of, you know, processes with peaks at low frequencies, you can think of this as sort of some kind of uh, either dispersion or, or, or drift or something that's sort of making something move in that, in that sort of uh, long-term sort of sense that creates that, that low frequency peak. And, and, and if we sort of remove uh, the mean, we would think of that as this sort of idea of um, background dispersion or often called sort of background turbulence in, in this kind of data. Okay, the red one's really interesting because we get the same kind of shape, but the peaks have shifted. Um, that dominant peak is now on the right, so this oscillation is actually anti-clockwise, this red one that you're seeing here, um, and that's actually an eddy. So that's not, not a Coriolis oscillation, that's an eddy. The kind of eddy you might observe when you're standing on that bridge looking under the river, you see little eddies on the sides often. This is sort of a big ocean eddy, uh, which can have sort of scales of, you know, tens of kilometers in, in their size. Um, and what we see actually, interestingly, and, and Shen studied this, this too, is that you get this, this shift in the in the peak here so the Coriolis frequency hasn't changed but the location of the peak has so there's actually a hidden oscillation within this that you can't see by naked eye but for those of you who've done spectral analysis know you that you you often re can reveal hidden peaks by doing um spectral based analysis and we see the second hidden oscillation um but shifted from where we expect it to be and, and a little bit more on that in just a moment um, so with that in mind, our sort of motivation, high level, sorry, I'll go back, I just managed to, to overdo it, is that, you know, I've, I've shown you how these drifters can have both solid, oscillatory and turbulent flow, and our goal is, is not just to estimate means, but to go beyond that and get these sort of second order properties, right? Um, and it's not easy to separate these effects by just doing basic signal processing like bandpass filtering because there's, they have unknown bandwidth, their time scale frequencies can overlap. Um, so our, we're gonna take a more sort of uh, modeling based approach, which is to model them as stochastic processes, um, and then try and find these parameters using um, spectral analysis. Okay, so this is the only slide with equations, because I thought let's, let's condense it all into, into one. Um, so our idea is to model inertial oscillations, so that's the sort of Coriolis-induced um, oscillations, as, as a complex-valued einstein uhlenbeck process, which has been around since the 60s by Arato and Kolmogorov. And it has this following stochastic differential equation representation. So Z is our time series, and its increments in T. Um, for those of you who've seen a regular OU process, you'll be familiar with the, the damping term here creating what we could think of as like a, a sort of a, a mean reversion to keep the process stationary. So lambda is positive, you have a negative acting on Z. This is a, a Brownian, um, this is increments of a Wiener process um, with, with an amplitude A0, uh, A0. And what's new in the complex OU is this addition of this parameter F0 multiplied by I, which is just square root of minus one, um, which creates oscillations at frequency F0 in the signal. So we have a, an oscillation frequency, a damping, and an amplitude. So we can think of this as a force-damped oscillator. Um, and that actually uh, connects with, with things in a, um, 
I've got, I've had my uh, keynote crash. So hopefully we'll come back in just a second. There we go. I'll just go again. Yeah, we're back. Okay. Yeah. So this, we can think of this as a stochastic analog of some well-known physical models in oceanography, like the damp slab model of, of, of Pollard and Millard, right? So we sort of picked a stochastic analog of a physical model. And the Lagrangian spectrum there is quite simply just given by a simple function of those three parameters where we have the amplitude, the location of the peak in the spectrum and a damping term, which sort of sets the, 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 the breadth of that peak. Um, and what we found for the, for the peak at zero that I showed you, and, and, and Mikhail's very familiar with this process too, is to model turbulent flow as a matern process, um, which has this Lagrangian spectrum, uh, which is similar, but different in two ways. First of all, F naught is just zero, so we set the peak at zero, but we added in this, we add in this alpha exponent in the, um, in the denominator. And this is actually really useful because with, you can now have different spectral decays in your spectrum, which is something that we, we actually observe and has been observed both theoretically and empirically in Lagrangian spectra um, uh, of, of velocities. Um, so there's no SDE representation here that's valid. And in fact, it's a stochastic integral equation. And that's because this is kind of a fractal type process. For those of you who work with like things like fractal, fractional Brownian motion, you can think of this as like a stationary analog, where we still have damping, it's still stationary, but it allows this idea of, of, of whether you, you're familiar with Hurst exponents or fractal dimension of kind of allowing like a, a different roughness or smoothness in your trajectory, okay? And for more details, there's a plug plug for the paper where this this work was published a few years ago. Uh, Adam, um, Adam, let me just mention there's a brief clarifying question in the chat box. So Michael Stein is asking whether uh, W is real or a complex in your equation there. Uh, w is real. Okay, yeah. so hopefully that clarifies. Oh no, sorry, sorry. Uh, omega, omega is real. W here is is complex. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I believe the question was about that W, so hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, W is complex, yeah. It's a, it's a complex Wiener process, which is, uh, which is complex proper, for those of you, for, the, for people who are aware of that, which means it's sort of an isotropic complex normal. Yeah, sorry, yeah, my bad. Omega, of course, is real in its frequency, yeah. Um, and then the idea is, is, to, is, is to aggregate this as just additive stochastic model. So we, we may also have tides. So we can just sort of have these sort of several humped models and we can sort of pick how many humps we want and, and have this idea of background flow and oscillatory flow in, in one model. Um, and let's, let's, let's jump ahead and fit that to the data. So here's the green trajectory we looked at before. And here's its Lagrangian frequency spectrum. And we fit our model with a, a matern and a complex OU. There's no tides in, in this data um, or no significant tides. And we just fit it in a narrow-ish band of frequencies. Um, and there's a few reasons for that, which, which I could go into in, 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 if there's time. But you can see that we fitted our model to the frequencies in this sort of range here. And we've picked up these two peaks and got an estimate for the peak locations, but also their amplitudes and their, their damping, um, and also the slope parameter uh, on the meter. Um, and then if we look at the, the red trajectory, where we had that shift, then obviously we, we, we've managed to sort of pick that up, right? So we, have, we, we can pick up this, this peak shift here, but still recover all the other parameters. And it turns out that actually this, this shift here is actually caused by the eddy, right? So the difference between eddy and zero, if you like, is this difference between the observed peak and, and the Coriolis frequency of the inertial oscillation. So that's, that's kind of something we can, you know, for example, try to pick up in other regions of the ocean um, using this model. 
Um, so I'll show you a few more animations and then I'll take a pause for more questions. So, so we, we wanted to motivate the matern and part of its motivation is empirical but also we wanted to sort of see if we could relate this to some turbulence theory as well. So here what we see is, is, is going into the world of numerical models. So this is Jeffrey Early's expertise in, in, uh, in Seattle at NWRA. And what we see is this beautiful simulation he's put together of something called quasi-geostrophic turbulence. And um, well, it's sort of a, a, a flow field that he's, he's created in a, sim, in a numerical simulated environment. And what he's done is he's, he's sort of thrown in synthetic drifters, if you like, and that's these black dots here. So he said, how would a drifter move across? How would a, a, a parcel, a water particle, move on, on its journey across this, across this, um, this idealized um, flow field? And to motivate the use of the matern, we, we look to see whether some of the properties here match with the matern. So what we've done in the next slide is we've taken all of these drifters and moved them to the same starting location and watched them spread. So we haven't changed their trajectories. We've just said, what if they all had started at the same place? Uh, and that's what you see here on the left. So it's exactly the same trajectories. I've not changed them in any way. And I've just watched them spread. And that circle is just the second moment of their, of their position sort of growing in time. And then what we've done is we fitted a matern to this data. We haven't overfitted. We fitted it with the same parameters for every simulated drifter on the right. Um, so we've just picked one amplitude, one slope, and one damping and simulated the same number of trajectories and started them in the same position. And so these are matern velocities and these are what the positions look like. And what we see is obviously a visual similarity between left and the right, but also some properties which match. In particular, this, uh, this growing circle um, actually gives you this rate of dispersion, right? Uh, the rate at which this circle is growing. And what we see is that we want the, is that what we observe with QG turbulence is that we have what's called a diffusive process, which means this, the area of this circle grows linearly in time. So actually its radius grows, grows with the square root of time. So you could think of that like it, the 3D equivalent is if you're blowing into a balloon with a constant force from your lungs, then the, the volume will grow constantly in time right? But actually the radius will grow at the cube root of time, for example. So this is sort of the same idea of blowing something up um, that we get this property. And the matern gives us this property too, and we can show that. We can show that we get this property of the area growing linearly in time, and we can give you that rate, and that rate is something called the diffusivity, and we can give it as a function of the other three parameters. So if we've estimated the matern parameters, we've also estimated the diffusivity. Okay, so there's also these sort of nice properties that come out. And Jonathan Lilly's written a paper um, explaining how matern model is a nice model for turbulent velocities. Um, and you can email me if you can't find, find that paper. Um, so what I'll do is I'll take another, I'll take another pause for a couple of questions because I've just got a few more slides to wrap up after that. So if anybody has questions, uh, feel free to put either in the chat box or use the raise hand button. I see Tyler is unmuted. Uh, Tyler, do you want to ask a question? Always. <laughs> so is this, um, what, what happens when one of these drifters go beyond the boundary? Of this uh, of this chart, do they do they bounce back, or how, how do you deal with boundary conditions here? Yeah, I mean that that that's a great question. So so if we go back a slide, then um, uh, let's just run that. Then there's there's different ways you can deal with it, but typically people uh, have in this numerical world setting, they'll either have periodic boundaries, right? Yeah. Or yeah. They'll, they might make things like reflect or whatever. Um, 
so so there there is that issue here um, but when we simulated the the matern um, what we've sort of done in so here there's that issue but in this next plot there isn't that issue because we've kind of unwrapped that right so right. there's no boundary here because if it's jumped over we've just let it continue to expand if that makes sense yeah yeah um so, so, so there's no boundary here which is why you'll see things do exit the the artificial boundaries i've put here yeah thank you thank you okay so we have a, a bunch of questions in the chat box so uh first there's a question about uh this concept of tracers from climate models so so in climate models there's this you know idea of a tracer and the question is are, are these drifters sort of analogous to tracers in, in climate models Yeah, I don't know, Mikhail. I, I don't know enough about traces and climate models. Does anyone else want to comment on that? So I, I wonder if, if Shane or, or Fred or others who have familiarity with both climate models and this kind of data want to say something. Uh, yeah, um, this is Fred. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of similarities. Shane can, uh, can verify that. Um, the one thing that tracers have that Drifters don't. Well, well, drifters, of course, stay at the surface because they're that's the way they work. Uh, but also, tracers can often have decay terms that the drifters would not have. You know, like 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 they can they can be eaten by biology or or, um, or radioactively decay and stuff over time. Those are two of the differences that I can think of off the top of my head. The next question. So, uh, so there's a question about the, the decay rate of 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 spectra for turbulence, and in particular, the question is that is the estimated value of alpha in this matern uh, model is it consistent with one of those uh, theoretical values of of a similar parameter from kind of theoretical models of, of turbulence? Yeah, that's a really great question. So we get we get different alpha values here than we than we do with the real drifters and there's there's a number of reasons for that um, I suspect um, here we typically get quite large alpha values and there is actually um, some sort of theory which which supports um, an exponential decay which sort of means alpha going to infinity right um, so the fact that we're getting it getting it large and, and eventually almost have to bound it from above can can sort of you know, almost intuitively makes sense. There, there is theory about things that are observed in Lang Lagrangian frequency spectra from different simulations. I've seen like 3.3 and, and so online. Uh, but we, we haven't ever actually got that either from these simulations or from the real data. I will jump ahead to show, because it's a really good question. So it's only just three slides ahead that when we fitted this to the the data, the the alpha that we're getting, we're actually getting a median of 1.1 globally, with sort of a lot of ones, which is actually so an alpha equals one corresponds to like a an Ornstein Uhlenbeck process. It's an omega to the minus uh, two decay, right? So for some people, they would think of that as an 0.5 return, and I apologize for that confusion. Um, here we've sort of alpha is the slope decay. Um, but I think people who are used to sort of the sort of the the matern, just sort of dealing with like matern and krigging and so on, would would might would, would think of that as an 0.5. Um, so that's what we're sort of getting from from uh, from the real data. And um, yeah, I think it's a bit of an open question actually, um, how that ties in with the theory. That's sort of an observational result. One more question, uh, uh, and let's try to be fairly quick so that we have time to wrap up. So the, 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 the third question is, is the process driven by white noise? So I suppose that's for the, the stochastic um, uh, differential equation yes. there. Is, is it white noise that is driving it? Um, yeah, that, I mean, you know, uh, the, there's no SDE representation of a matern. So in an OU sense, then yes, it's driven by by increments of a, of a Wiener process. So, in, so we can think of that as, 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 as white noise. Um, 
with a matern, there's like this, 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 this fractal idea. So in the stochastic, it's defined by a stochastic integral equation where yes, you do have this DWT term in that um, equation. So yes, it's, it, you can think of it as being driven by a white noise, yeah. Okay, very good. So let's, uh, 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 let's maybe move on. So we have about nine minutes left. So uh, let's try to wrap up yeah, the, the rest of up. the talk during that time. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, I mean, basically I can wrap up any moment, Mikhail, so you just tell me when to, when to finish. But I guess I'll just, I'll just add, maybe finish with, with um, just a couple of more results from the drifters, which is, um, first of all, this idea of locally stationary modeling. So we can, we can fit these parameters in a sort of time varying sense. I know people on this call would have done similar things to this before by taking local windows to sort of get an idea of how these parameters might be evolving as the drifters move in space and time. So that's what this sort of animation is just showing a rolling window approach. Um, and then one thing I'll just do a little plug at the end for some work that I've done with Jeffrey in the last few years is this idea of moving to anisotropy. So all of these models so far have sort of been isotropic in, in, in X and Y or U and V. Here is, is sort of beta plane turbulence, which is like turbulence on a sphere. And we've sort of ramped it up to sort of Jupiter-like settings. So you see in this turbulence, there's sort of these jets going east-west and, and north-south, not as much. So there's this anisotropy forming. And we've sort of built, um, so if you look at the velocities from a drifter, U and V, you'll see more in U than in V. And I'll jump ahead a bunch of slides just to, because there's some equations for how we sort of model anisotropy by adding one more parameter to a matern to create a four parameter anisotropic matern, um, which we do via this idea of rotary coherency. And again, I apologize for the lack of time for the details, but I'll sort of show you here's us fitting the rotary coherency, which, which creates anisotropy to the data using one additional parameter. And then the result is that we can, the power spectrum for U and V become anisotropic and the red anisotropic matern can capture, for example, this dip that we see in V at low frequencies, but is otherwise a matern at high frequencies. And the result is that we can create this, this anisotropic matern. So we can get this idea of, of things spreading differently in X and Y but it, this isn't just a stretched and rescaled version of a matern. It's actually anisotropic at low frequencies, but at high frequencies, it's still isotropic. So if we zoomed in on this, it would become increasingly more isotropic. So this is sort of idea that, that at long scales, we observe different behavior to, to at short scales. And I know, Mikhail, you wanted some time to wrap up. So I'll just, I'll, just, I'll end there um, and invite any more questions if we have time. Okay, yeah, we, have, uh, we do have a, a, a couple of more questions here. So first from Tyler, there's a question about the different positioning systems. So, so the question is, uh, uh, do you believe that the, the difference between uh, GPS and Argos would, would have influence on this, these results? Yeah, again, Shen will be in a better position to answer that. But, but you know, Shen, Shen did a cracking job to get the Argos um, uh, data to the to the to a close quality of gps data but going forwards my understanding is that this is going to be fully gps shen might correct me and yeah we can get slightly better resolution i think for that smaller scale behavior um we we can get more out of the gps do you have any comments shen um, yeah, sorry. So there's a lot of details in that 2016 paper that, you know, we wrote together, Adam, and, you know, thank you very much for uh, helping me out at that moment. So the, for Argos uh, trajectories tracked drifters, um, what we found is that the noise was definitely not Gaussian. And so it was better described by a student's T distribution um, by fitting parameters. So taking into account those type of errors allowed us to uh, derive a better way of interpolating the data to produce those early even time uh, step um, time series. As for the GPS, I have to say that um, that's something new that I'm looking at. And Jeffrey, early, I spent quite a bit of time looking at that. Um, the type of noise that 
GPS tracking induces um, is something that I yet don't know about. Yeah, we did a bit, I did a bit, I think we also found T, T errors and just outliers as well. So um, okay. I think you get more, more sort of more jumps, but you still even at, without those jumps, you still get T errors, but you, but resolution maybe that's sort of order 10 rather than order hundreds. Uh, to get meters. meters, yeah, meters, yes, yeah, typical errors, yeah, yeah. Okay, then there's a best, uh, question from Peter Craigmile. Uh, so the question is, uh, is, is there evidence that these processes may be multifractal, uh, uh, mm. which presumably means that that there would be more than just one alpha governing the processes? Uh, and there's a few follow-ups to, to that as well, but that's the the first part of the question. Yeah, that's a cracking question. I, I've, 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 I've dabbled in this multifractal DFA stuff. Peter knows about it more than I do. Uh, we haven't looked, and I think it's a great idea. We should, we should, we should look at that. Cracking, cracking question. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, and then the follow-up is: uh, Are you worried that you only estimate alpha in a given bandwidth using the spectral estimates? Yes, so um, so one thing I didn't get to expand on, uh, I may have sort of misled everyone in these earlier plots. Um, let's hope that doesn't crash on me uh, when I. Yeah, this is this is perfect. Is that we? This is this was to pick up the oscillations, but when we when we're just interested in the slope of the matern, we can use the entire. Uh, right hand side of the spectrum and go as far as we want. We don't do this bit and that's because this is basically interpolation artifacts, right? So this is, this is, this stage I think has been uh, crigged uh, with, with, you know, um, the square exponential. So we're seeing this roll off. You would have seen this before Mikhail, right? Um, so, so we would sort of maybe go to here and, and estimate alpha on the, the, the beautiful right hand side of the spectrum is uncontaminated by oscillations here. So that's something that we do. So we can just fit a three parameter and return to the right hand side in this case, once we get rid of tides and stuff like that. Okay, and uh, let's have one more final question here uh, from Chris Forrest. And the question is that does the uh, QG turbulence, uh, so I presume your turbulence model here, does it show convergence of the of the drifters uh, in contrast to two D turbulence? Oh, like convergent zones. So um, uh, yeah, I suppose this is like you know you know for example for plastics, you know that there are these convergence yeah, areas where yeah. surface currents seem yeah. to converge. Yeah, yeah. So does your model show any yeah. evidence for for things like that? No, not the. I mean, Jeffrey would expand, but my understanding is no. These these are these those simulations are sort of what they'd call. Divergence free, they're sort of, um, um, you know, they have the, 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 the smooth stream functions and everything um, that are implied. So, yeah, so no, so no, but that's a really interesting question um, about, about like the convergence of, of, of plastics and so on. Um, that, yeah, I'm, I don't have too much to say there. I know there's lots of other people in the Lagrangian world who, who have looked at that, like uh, Eric Van Sabi and so on. Cool. And uh, I see there's a reference there on the, on the chat box. Um, but with that, I think, so we are, we are coming to half pass. So I suggest that we will kind of wrap up the official part here. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll also stop the recording. Uh, if Adam wants to stay around for a moment to, you know, ask any informal questions and people have time to stay around, uh, okay. we can do that. But I'll just stop the recording here.